Good afternoon, everyone. Librarian Danielle Villanchi here from the Côte Saint Luc Public Library. Today we have another great program for you. The library is thrilled to have the opportunity to host a live conversation with best-selling author and musician Glenn Dixon. Thank you very much, Glenn, for taking the time to join me today from Calgary. Thank you also to Andreas at Paragraph Bookstore for collaborating with us on this event. Thank you to uh, Mackenzie as well. And at the end of the event, I'll give you some details in case you'd like to buy your own copy of Glenn's first fiction novel online or in store at Paragraph. Uh, if you miss it, the librarian can assist you as well. And we also have copies at the library, but probably already on the wait list. <laughs> So to begin with, I'll share a condensed bio. Glenn Dixon is the number one best-selling author of the memoir, Juliet's Answer. He has played in bands all of his life, traveled through more than 75 countries and written for National Geographic, the New York Post, the Globe and Mail, the Walrus and Psychology Today. Before becoming a full-time writer, he taught high school English for 20 years. He lives in Calgary with his girlfriend, visit him at glendixon.ca or follow him on Twitter at Glenn uh, underscore underscore. I'm sorry. <laughs> I lost the word for a second. Dixon. Uh, welcome Glenn. And thank you so much for filling uh, in that gap for me. Uh, and congratulations on such a fun coming of age musical joy ride, uh, a book that I would say is perfect for summer. Um, as you've heard, you have a very interesting resume. Can you tell us a bit about your work writing for all the publications I just listed, including National Geographic, The New York Post, Psychology Today? Well, it's, uh, it's been kind of a long road. I think I, I really started as a travel writer. So, you know, thus the National Geographic kind of uh, articles. So, uh, wrote a lot of magazine articles I, uh, you know like probably like a lot of authors i have drawers full of uh unfinished novel manuscripts <laughs> that uh, were frankly quite terrible um i think it was 2009 my first book was published so my first couple of books were were travel travel books um and then my third book was juliet's answer which i suppose we're going to talk about a little bit <laughs> Yes, so please tell us about uh, writing Juliet's answer. Well, it it started out as a, as a travel book. So the the first I should explain the first two books were um, the first one was languages around the world. I'd done a master's degree in linguistics. Uh, the second one was about music around the world. Um, so I but it's nonfiction. So I took zitar lessons on the banks of the Ganges River in India, and I went to Bob Marley's house in Jamaica, and I, I did all these crazy things to write about music around the world. So the third book was supposed to be about love around the world, and I was going to write about uh, marriage rituals and courtship practices in different cultures and um, uh, uh, my literary agent at the time thought that was a terrible idea, but I had, I had written the first chapter. I thought it was just going to be a chapter, which was, um, going to Verona and I joined, uh, the secretaries of Juliet, which is a group of Italian women who answer the hundreds of letters they get every year just addressed to Juliet, care of Verona, Italy, and talking about their, their heartbreak. And really, it was going to be just kind of a, a laugh and a lark and um, in a single chapter in a book. But my literary agent uh, convinced me that there was a whole book in this idea. And then I'm not going to get into it, but there all sorts of things happen in my own love life that I had no intention of writing about. But uh, I ended up writing about it. I wrote my own letter to Juliet. And that book, Juliet's Answer, became uh, a bestseller, published in 12 countries and translated into five different languages. And uh, really, it, it just skyrocketed. So did the idea come to you because you wanted to visit Verona in part? Oh, absolutely. You know, I love Italy. It's one of my favorite places in the world. It's got the best food and 
the language is beautiful. So, um, you know, I, I'll give you the spoiler is I basically met the love of my life uh, writing these letters. She's upstairs right now, actually. <laughs> She'd be embarrassed if I was saying all this. But yeah, so fantastic experience. That was a book that uh, turned out completely different than what I had first intended. But that sounds like a fantastic uh, journey in itself, writing uh, Juliet's answer. Uh, I also mentioned in your biography that you taught uh, high school English for 20 years. Can you tell us about this experience and yeah. how maybe it helped guide you towards your career in writing? Yeah, sure. So, um, well, now we can start to talk a little bit about what we're supposed to be talking about, bootleg stardust. Uh, in my 20s, as a young man, I just wanted to be a rock star. And I played guitar in bands and I lived in Toronto and... Um, uh, I remember a particular moment when I was in my late 20s and I, I think I opened the refrigerator and there was nothing in there, maybe an apple and a, a, a half of a chocolate bar. And, and that's about it. And I thought, this, this is ridiculous. I can't do this anymore. Um, and that's when I became a teacher. And of course, I became an English teacher, teaching Romeo and Juliet for many, many years, of course. So thus Juliet's answer. Um, but you know, it left it never left my head this wanting to be a rock star. And I thought, okay, well, if I can't be a rock star, at least I could write about a rock star. <laughs> so that brings us to bootleg stardust. So before I, I just give a synopsis of the plot, um, so you mentioned your experience in teaching and you experienced you mentioned also your traveling and the books that you wrote previously before your foray into fiction. Um, tell us a bit about how you integrate being a musician and writing at the same time. Ah, uh, well, there's lots of uh, background stories about this this novel. Um, it just so have I hadn't actually actually played in a band for quite a while. You know, I still have my guitar and I strum it by myself up in my bedroom, but um, maybe four or five years ago, I fell in with this group of guys who were all, all like me, you know, we'd, we'd wanted to be rock stars when we were younger and, you know, life got in. The, what does John Lennon say? Life is, life is what happens when you're making other plans. And <laughs> that is what happened. So some of the, some of the guys got married, had kids, and uh, now 20 years later, 30 years later, we've kind of come together again as a real band. And uh, these guys are really fine musicians. So I don't think I connected the dots right away that I wanted to write a book about a, a young rock star in the, it's 1974, it's the setting of the book and actually playing in the, a real band. But as soon as the writing started happening, I don't even know who had the first idea said, you know, when, what, what are the songs of this fictional band in the book? Fictional band in the book is called Downtown Exit, um, which was deliberately meant as a sort of generic band name from the 70s. And the guys in the band said, well, how about we write the songs and actually record them? So everything just started fitting together. But I always get carried away and I start talking a lot more about the music <laughs> than I start talking about the book. So I always have to like bring myself back and you know, I'm supposed to be talking about the book here. <laughs> so this is a perfect segue. So right now, uh, before we talk too much about one side of things, I will share a synopsis of the plot for those listening in. Daisy Jones and the Six Meets Nick Hornby in this debut novel about a young musician who auditions for a band and is suddenly uh, catapulted into the world, the wild world of rock and roll stardom where nothing is quite what it seems. Sometimes you have to hit rock bottom on your way to the top. It's 1974, the music world is rocking with bell bottoms, platform shoes, and lots and lots of drugs. This year's sensation is an American band called Downtown Exit, and their latest album has just gone gold. For high school dropout, Levy Jackson, things aren't so great. After bouncing around foster homes for years, he's living in his best friend's basement. 
His dream is to someday be a rock star, but he has a big problem. His own band has just broken up. In an uncanny stroke of luck, Levy lands an audition for Downtown Exit, who are now recording their second album at the famous Abbey Road Studios. So there it is in a nutshell. Of course, there's a lot more to the novel than this. Uh, but Glenn, uh, what made you decide to tell this story? And did you know your band would be recording a soundtrack for the book when the idea first popped into your head? I, I had no idea there was actually going to be a full soundtrack for this book. That kind of emerged as I was uh, as I was saying. Um, very cool, I, by the way. Very cool. Yeah, <laughs> and we'll talk about this. But uh, I think I, I knew I wanted to write. A, I, I knew I wanted to have a character, Levi Jackson, who was this really quite a talented young guy, but from nowhere. Uh, plays guitar in his basement and is desperately making demo takes, uh, tapes on a cassette tape. <laughs> yes. That's what it was in those days. And I, I mean, I did the same thing back in the day. Uh, and you'd send them out to record companies and, you know, hoping against hope that somebody would listen to it. Um, I, I, I wanted to say, I, I said it in 1974, which is a little bit before my time, but I had an older brother who used to bring home albums and uh, to this day, it's just an amazing time in music. It was the time, you know, Leonard Cohen's first album, uh, Joni Mitchell, Cat Stevens, and the harder stuff, Led Zeppelin, Deep Purple. Uh, the title of the book, Bootleg Stardust, of course, is a little nod to David Bowie and his uh, Ziggy Stardust <laughs> and, and the Spiders from Mars. So there was a little period there of Oh, I don't know, maybe from Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band to about Bohemian Rhapsody, where, where the musicians were uh, really pushing the limits, you know? It was no big deal to have a song that was eight minutes long and that could go on the radio. And the album covers were real pieces of art. And um, I, so I knew I wanted to set it in that time. And I also knew that I wanted to have a main character, Levi Jackson, very young, very naive, very talented, who finds himself caught up in, the, in this world, which, which I guess I should say is it, it's not what it seems. There's, yes. it, I have trouble talking about this because there's so many spoilers I have to <laughs> avoid uh, uh, because everyone's got a secret um nothing is really as it seems so something i found quite fascinating uh about this story uh is that you recorded in the legendary rolling stones mobile recording unit that had not been used in what seems to be about 25 years and it is now housed in the national music center of canada that's where you live in calgary yeah, so let, uh, let me explain about this because, um, yeah, this was like a dream come true. There is this old truck. Uh, it looks like it looks like a beat up old moving van, really, that was um, owned by the Rolling Stones. Um, uh, they recorded one of their famous albums, Exile on Main Street. They were became tax exiles because uh, in the early 70s, the amount of tax they had to pay in the UK was astronomical. So uh, they decided they would move to France and record in a villa on, in the south of France. And so they built this truck and in the back of it, it has a, a state-of-the-art recording studio. Uh, it became so popular that Led Zeppelin used it on four of their albums. Bob Marley used it, uh, Deep Purple. <laughs> the, the list of people that used it is extraordinary. Um, and then the history of it is it kind of dropped into anonymity in maybe the 80s. And uh, I, I, I think somebody found it in a warehouse or something. So um, maybe six or seven years ago, uh, it was bought by the National Music Center in Calgary. So National Music Center of Canada, it, if you are ever traveling out to Calgary, of course, go to the mountains, they're beautiful. But in the city itself, I would suggest go to this, this building, it's remarkable. It looks like the Guggenheim Museum, it's remarkable. 
So they, uh, they bought this old truck, they refurbished it, they built a room right around it. So it's enclosed in the museum now. And um, they decided that they don't want it just to be a museum piece. They want people to come in and, and use it. And that was just about the time I was writing this novel and we had this grand idea of, well, let's record some of these songs. I phoned them and I said, is it, would it be possible that we could, you know, go in and record on this thing? I said, well, we're so glad you asked because we just finished all the rewiring and it's, it's all ready to go. Why don't you come down and you will be the first ones to use it. So I remember going down there and uh, walking into the back of this beat up old truck and thinking, wow. Mick Jagger was in here, and <laughs> Keith Richards, and this is what they use. And now we're going to use it. And we also wanted to have our songs for the fictional band, Downtown Exit, really sound like they were songs from the early 70s. So it, it was just a, a perfect alignment of the stars came together. And, and we recorded on the Rolling Stones mobile. Yeah, that's, that's so cool. Um must have been extraordinary as an experience to be able to do that. Did yeah. you um, have to book ahead of time or they were just so excited that someone wanted to use it? Yeah, I think we were, like I said, one of the very first people to use it. So, um, I mean, we still had to book it. So, the, as I said, the, the, the old truck has a, a room built around it and we were actually upstairs in the proper recording studio with all these... Um, well, cables stringing out of the back of it um, up to us in the studio with a, a, a video link to the engineer who's sitting in the dark dungeon of this truck. And uh, yeah, it was just a fantastic experience. And I guess I should say that um, uh, the truck also appears in the novel itself. Yes. So uh, yes. it's in the later chapters, but uh, essentially, they and I, I researched the history of this. So I found a time when the truck in real history uh, was not being used by anybody. And it was in Switzerland because Keith Richards was in Switzerland okay. and it was basically in his backyard. And uh, <laughs> my fictional band kind of comes by and uh, well, there's another bit of a spoiler, but they basically steal it. <laughs> Because they are under tremendous pressure to finish their second album. Yes. So there's a lot of momentum in this book. It's not a long book. It's just about 300 pages. Uh, but you definitely, kudos to you, cram a lot uh, into the book, you know, uh, through the characters and through their journey and through their secrets. <laughs> and... Uh, so I would definitely recommend this as a, a summary to everyone. Um, stylistically, it's told from the point of view of, uh, I call them Levy, but Levi, yeah, you corrected me. Um, so tell us a little bit more about him. We know that uh, he was living in his best friend's uh, mom's basement. Uh, can you fill him in a little bit more for the audience? Uh, he's a young guy. He's 20 years old. Uh, his best friend is Rudy, um, who that's he, he lives in Rudy's mom's basement. Um, people ask me sometimes who's my favorite character, and I always say Rudy because <laughs> Rudy is this, kind of this tag along guy. Um, he's been a musician himself, but he's not very good, but he's kind of Levi's best friend. So, um, I also I really, in this book, wanted to have a, a strong sense of voice of what people spoke like in the in the early 70s, especially these young guys. So I always think of Rudy as kind of, oh, holy jeez, holy jeez, <laughs> Levi, what are you doing? He's this kind of goof, goofball character that tags along for the story. Definitely, I would say uh, Levi and Rudy are the goofy ones <laughs> in the book. <laughs> Uh, my favorite character was uh, Ariadne, ah. um, of course, <laughs> a little bit more sophisticated, a little bit more mysterious. Uh, can you tell, about, tell us a bit more about this character? Sure. And, and so that's, that's the characters on the front of the book. It's uh, yeah. Levi there and holding hands. 
<laughs> Got a mirror thing going on. <laughs> yes. And that's Ariadne. So yes, she's a very interesting character. Her father is a famous uh, Greek film director. So she's from an island in Greece called Naxos that I've been to many times. Just a beautiful, extraordinary island. She's lived most of her life in the UK, though. She's gone to school there. She's highly educated. Um, she's really kind of a polar opposite from Levi because Levi is from nowhere and he's not well educated and he tries really hard. But Ariadne's kind of already lived in this world of, of celebrity and she's highly educated. Oh, I guess I should say she's a poet. Yes. <laughs> uh, so she's a poet. And this is a part I could have written a lot more about this because uh, she studied at Oxford and she studied the romantic poets and especially John Keats and um, uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson. And of course, those writers, they wrote about Greece, but she's from Greece. So there comes a point in the book where she says, why am I, why am I studying these old dead English white guys when I am from Greece? And there's sort of a moment where uh, Levi said, well, then why don't you write about it? And she became, again, spoilers, but she starts to write lyrics for some of the guys in the band. Yes. Um, so some of the other characters, uh, one that stood out to me as well is Frankie. Can you tell us a little bit more about yeah. Mr. Rollercoaster Frankie? <laughs> so Frankie's the lead singer. He's the lead singer in Downtown Exit. Um, he's very full of himself. He's got a crazy sense of ego. Uh, so really a lot, of the, a lot of the tension in the book is when young Levi joins the band. And maybe I should talk a little bit about that. So yeah, let me just say that um, this is chapter two. So it's not too much of a spoiler is Levi, as I said, he's sending demo tapes to record companies. And you know, you never heard back from those record companies. I'm sure they got hundreds of cassette tapes every day. But in this case, and there is a reason behind it, he gets a call back from a, a record company saying, we need somebody for our band Downtown Exit. Can you come over to London, England? and your audition's gonna be at the amazing Abbey Road Studios where the Beatles, of course, did everything. And he goes in there and he's learned all the downtown exit songs because he really is quite a good musician. And um, he aces the audition and he gets the gig. The only thing is he's not really in the band. What's really happened is that the, the lead guitarist in the band, uh, he's dropping acid all the time in concerts. So, Sometimes this guy would make it through the show. Oftentimes he wouldn't. Halfway through the show when the LSD kicked in, he'd be spaced out and couldn't play his guitar anymore. So they hired Levi to play off stage and cover for him. So sort Levi was fill in for fill in yeah. for Pete. <laughs> yeah. So they set him up on a folding metal chair off behind the curtains <laughs> and set up a microphone in front of him because he's his voice his was quite similar, his singing voice was quite similar to Pete, the guitar player. So the sound man had something hooked up that when they saw that uh, Pete was freaking out on stage and not able to really do anything anymore, they'd flip things over to Levi playing off stage. Um, then some things happened, which I can't tell you about. <laughs> and Levi did eventually wind up fully in the band. But to bring it back to Frankie, who's the lead singer, Frankie did not like this at all. Uh, Frankie was also interested in Ariadne. So there was a bit of a love triangle there. Um, and just a, a tremendous amount of tension about this young new guy who was very talented and a really good songwriter joining the band and really kind of changing everything. And Frankie did not like that. So something that, uh, without giving away too much uh, from the novel, but something that I've heard um, definitely over the years about this particular time in music and even later in music is this whole idea of how the music industry sort of just takes more than it should have in yeah. terms of your rights and uh, 
So how did you come up with this angle sort of in the story? Well, there, there's so much of this book that is loosely based on, on real stories. And it was very, very common in the 60s and the 70s, and really still to this day, to some yeah. extent, that um, these are young guys and they just wanted to be musicians and, uh, you know, the stars in their eyes and somebody puts a contract in front of them that says, you're going to be rich, you're going to be famous, just sign here. Uh, and they didn't realize that they were signing away all their rights. Uh, one thing that happens in the book that was very common is um, they had to pay for the, all the, re the studio time. So even back in those days, the, these studios were very expensive, maybe sometimes $200 an hour. And these guys didn't know that. So they'd go in there and they'd play all night or, uh, you know, they'd write songs in the studios, which I can't believe that you know, this is $200, $200 an hour we're talking here. They didn't realize that. And then when the bills came in, they didn't realize that they were on the hook for that money. So there's many, many stories of, some of the most famous bands that I could name uh, who uh, were essentially broke. In fact, worse than broke, they owed sometimes millions of dollars to these record companies. Even though we would perceive they're rich and famous, when they're famous maybe, but they weren't rich. Definitely we get a sense that the people at the very top of the recording industry know exactly what they're doing and take advantage of Yeah of uh, the fact that these guys are young and not paying enough attention maybe to the lines in their contract and especially our main character has some issues that I won't get into. Uh, yeah. Um, so I can't really get into some of the relationships I'd like to talk to you about, but um, you mentioned it briefly because I mentioned Ariadne. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about sort of the coming of age and the, the blossoming relationship between uh, Levi and Ariadne? Um, Ariadne is there because she's left Oxford where she was studying poetry. Um, she's quite interested in photography, her dad being this famous film director. But, you know, she, I think she's also very conscious that she's being pushed into being like her father, uh, maybe because he has all the connections in the film world. Um, and she doesn't want to do that. She's still, she's still trying to find herself as well. Um, so she enters the scene as the band's photographer. And they ask her to come along on their European tour to... Uh, basically take photographs of, of them. And I think she is looking for what she really wants to do in life and recognizes the same in Levi. Um, and they kind of bond because they're both kind of outsiders. I, I do see Ariadne maybe a little bit more as a mentor of Levi as well, because she's seen this world. She's seen this world of celebrity. She's uh, highly educated, as I said. Um, she's been to these places. So if they go on tour, uh, they play a, bu a bunch of gigs in the U UK and in London, and, and they were all real places. And then they go to Amsterdam, Brussels, uh, three shows in Paris. And Ariadne's been to all these places many times. So uh, you know, Levi's in Paris with stars in his eyes going, oh my God, there's the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> and Ariadne's kind of, come on, don't be <laughs> such a tourist. Uh, let me show you the, the real place. And uh, she's, yeah, she's a bit of a mentor to Levi, I think. So we talked about the fact that uh, all of the songs that are the names of the chapters in the book are songs that you recorded uh, with the fictional band, but your real band, but in this case, yeah. Downtown Exit. Um, did you also, for the book, travel to all of the places that are mentioned? Switzerland, to Cannes, uh, to Naxos? Yeah, I, I have been to all these places, some of them a long time ago. So just before the pandemic happened, and I'm so glad I did this. I mean, nobody knew this pandemic was coming, but 
just literally a couple months before things shut down, I traveled to Europe and I, I already had the first draft of this done and I was remembering certain places. Um, but I thought, hey, let's just go over there and make sure you've got everything right. You know, I have a background as a travel writer, so this yeah. is kind of what I do. And <laughs> plus, I, I get to travel to Naxos, Greece. Are you kidding me? <laughs> and um, and then I had to go back, and I did have to change some things. I said, oh, no, on that street, you turn left, not right, or, or whatever it was. But um, uh, maybe now, on, on that trip, we can talk about what's my favorite thing of all is that five of the songs that we had uh, recorded, um, pretty much my five favorite songs, uh, the, the final process needed to be done. And early on in the book, there's the audition at Abbey Road Studios. And, you know, I've, I've, I've been there. I walked across the famous uh, crosswalk like, like every tourist in London <laughs> does, but I'd never been inside. I have no idea what the inside of Abbey Road Studios. So, it was similar to the story of the Rolling Stones mobile. I, I phoned them and I said, you know, uh, is it possible that I could actually go in there and work on these songs? And they said, we are a recording studio. Of, <laughs> of course you can, you can do that. And um, uh, I have some video of that that's quite funny because I had arrived in London the night before so uh, in the video, I can see clearly I was very jet lagged, <laughs> but, but yeah, I took, uh, I took five songs and walked in through those magical doors of Abbey Road Studios. I should say here that uh, I'm a huge Beatles fan. I, I, I love, I love the Beatles. I think they're the most amazing thing ever. So to walk into this place where the Beatles essentially re recorded everything from their very first audition to um, to the album that became Abbey Road, it um, it it all happened in that studio, and I was able to go in there and uh, work on my own songs. It was incredible. Well, that must have been surreal as yeah. <laughs> as an experience. Well, we're glad that you were able to kind of go around Europe one last time just before the pandemic hit uh, to get your material. Um, so some of the other characters uh, in the band, in the book, are Chester and Miguel. They're not, they're sort of secondary characters, um, but they're still interesting. Can you tell us a little bit about each of them? Yeah, Ch Chester is the, the drummer in the band. Uh, Miguel is the keyboard player. So this band, they're from New Jersey. Uh, maybe, I, maybe I was thinking a little bit about Bruce Springsteen. Um, and I think Frankie maybe kind of looks like Bruce Springsteen, but you know, there's many differences. And uh, when the when the band got famous, these guys were taken on as well. They they became regular members of the band, but but they weren't the original three guys. So they're also slight slightly outsider. Chester, the drummer, he kind of takes Levi under his wings because nobody else is paying attention to him and kind of shows him the ropes. Uh, Miguel is this mad genius on, on the keyboards. I kind of laugh because the keyboard player in our real band is called Michael. So Miguel is a loose version of, uh, of Michael and you know, the real, the real guys in my band, uh, we always kind of laugh about that because they, they recognize that they're not really that character, but they're playing the instrument of that character. Yes. Or, or the, the lead singer in our band, Jim, who's an incredible vocalist, uh, he's the voice of Frankie. He really is. Okay, so I, I will uh, just mention, uh, since we're talking about the, uh, your band members here, so you have Michael Danglemeyer on keyboards, yourself, guitar and voice, Jim Sarantis, lead vocals, Darren Stinson, drums, and Richard Maruk, bass guitar. Yeah, you got so, it. <laughs> so that's your band. That's, um, that's my band. What is your band's name when it is not playing downtown exit songs? Um, we uh, it was really Michael's band. He uh, he formed this years ago, so they were called the the Barrel Dogs. So 
we have a, a, a bit of a problem now in that now that the pandemic is winding down and we are we don't have any gigs booked just yet but when we do are we going to still appear as the barrel dogs or are we now going to say we're downtown exit and yeah. we're, we're not quite sure how to play this card <laughs> it's a good question i'm not sure you might just want to keep going on uh Riding on the coattails of downtown exit. That's kind of that's kind of what I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, one last character I'll ask you about because I don't think we should get into Evelyn because there's there's just too much going on with yeah. her. Um, is Surly or Bobby? Uh, yeah. Can you tell us about him and is he based on uh, a real character somewhere? Yeah, he certainly is. So. Uh, it's the manager of the band and his name is Surly Bob, but <laughs> nobody calls him Surly Bob to his face, of course, <laughs> but um, he's loosely based on the manager for Led Zeppelin and the manager for Led Zeppelin was this big bear of a guy called Peter Grant. Uh, he was huge. I think it was six foot four and 300 pounds <laughs> and mean as you can imagine. He would if you didn't agree with him, he would pull a gun on you. He was that kind of a guy. So I think uh, Surly Bob in the book is loosely based on him, except that really, even though he's hard to get along with, he really is the guy that's looking after these boys in the band. Uh, he's one of the last remaining people that is able or even understands how to protect them from the record company. Uh, he understands that the money they get from touring, that's their own money. And the record company can't really touch that. So he's the one saying, we got to get out on tour. Um, whereas re the recording studio and all that stuff, that's, that's a whole different scene. So in the book, there are several instances where he is, you know, clutching to this cash box. Uh, yeah, <laughs> the famous cash box. <laughs> yes. Uh, so what do you say? I had different reads of this character throughout the book. You know, at some point I was thinking, is he for them or against them? Um, but my ideas kind of shifted throughout the novel. Uh, was this your intention or would you say he was one or the other, or he's more of a gray kind of character. Um, the, this book is told from the viewpoint of Levi, and yeah. it's, in, it's in first person. So it's always, uh, I, I'm thinking this, I'm doing this, and it's Levi. So this world is seen through Levi's eyes. And certainly at the beginning, he's terrified of <laughs> Surly Bob, as everybody is. Uh, and I think you slowly come to realize, and other guys in the band, like I think we mentioned Chester. I think there's one point where Chester tells Levi, you know, you don't get it to you. Uh, Surly Bob is, is the only guy who's really got our back. And even though he's this tough, really hard to get along with guy, I think as, as Levi comes to realize yeah, he was the guy looking after us. So you said of this book um, that sometimes you have to hit rock bottom on your way to the top. Is this something you personally experienced? <laughs> uh, not as bad as in the book. But <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I, I, uh, I wanted to be a rock star in, in, the, in my 20s and uh, I, I could see it's a, it's a really hard, hard life. Even if you make it, it's a really hard life. But the idea of touring in the back of a van and driving across the country as big as Canada, you know, I, I know many stories of musicians that would play one night in Regina and then the next night they're supposed to be playing in Toronto. It, it you know, it's, they didn't even sleep. They just have to drive all night to try and get to the next gig to make $50, you know, it's crazy. With these dreams always looming over them of, uh, if we just keep going, we're gonna make it. And oftentimes that's not the case. 
Uh, you also speak about, or I'm not sure if it's you that speaks about it, or I heard this about the book. It's it's about um, how music brings people together, but it's also about finding your own voice. Yeah. Can you say a few words about that? Well, sure. I, I think most of the characters, it's it's really the story of them finding their own voice. Certainly Ariadne, who comes to realize that she doesn't want to study poetry. She wants to be a poet. She doesn't want to be a photographer and follow in her father's footsteps. She wants to be a poet. And what opens up for her with this band is that she can write lyrics. Uh, you know, and at that point, I am thinking Leonard Cohen or Joni Mitchell or some of these songwriters that are just brilliant, brilliant poets. Um, Levi, I think towards the end, he has the terrible realization that he's signed away the rights to his own songs. Um, and I think, you know, he he could give up anything. Yeah, I'll, I'll play guitar on other people's music. I'll sing on other people's music. But the songs I wrote myself, that's me. That's like the deepest part of my soul. And no, you can't take that away from me. So to, the, the later chapters are his, his fight to, to win these songs back. So one of the songs uh, is Wine Dark Sea. Yeah. And is that taken from uh, Homer's Odyssey? <laughs> it sure is. So this is this is a this is the only song in the book where you see him, Levi, first writing the song on a ferry over the English Channel. I think uh, later on introducing it to some of the guys in the band, and 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 and, and so I do I. I, I know this world and I know what it's like to when you bring the song into the band and they, they're saying, well, maybe I could do this on it and thinking, no, that's terrible. And say, <laughs> oh, I never even thought of that. That's fantastic. And you kind of you kind of workshop it with with the guys in the band. So you see that and then you see the, fi the final recording of it on, in fact, on the Rolling Stones mobile. But uh, this song was really his attempt to win the heart of Ariadne. He knows she's Greek. She's actually had a photography exhibit where she had a, uh, one little photograph she'd taken from Naxos, the island of Naxos, and she's titled it uh, Wine Dark Sea. So for those that don't know, Wine Dark Sea is one of the famous lines from the Odyssey from Homer. So it's 3000 years old and um, it's just this Beautiful line. Uh, the rest of the lyrics in that song are uh, actually from Alfred Lord Tennyson, heavily adapted to you know fit the music from his poem uh, Ulysses, which is one of my favorite poems. So Levi didn't know very much about literature or uh, poetry for sure, but Ariadne had bought him a little book on, you know, in Paris, they have the, those bookshops along the Seine River. Uh, Bucanistas, they're called, with these little uh, green metal booths that the, the bookshop owners open them up every morning, and they have newspapers there, but also a lot of dog-eared paperbacks. So in Paris, as they're walking along the Seine, uh, Ariadne decides she will buy Levi a book of poetry. There's more going on here. You know what I'm talking about, but spoilers that I can't tell you. <laughs> but um, she does say that this poem, Ulysses by Alfred Lord Tennyson, is her all-time favorite poem. So Levi, very deliberate, he's got the music, but he has no words for this song. So he managed to fit the words of this poem into the song that becomes Wine Dark Sea, which now is a real song. And yeah, I guess I, I could say at this point that we have put all these songs up on all the services. So spotify or youtube or wherever you listen to music you can go and look for downtown exit and surprise you're going to find these actual songs yes i've gone to listen to a few of them and they're great, oh, great. Uh, so oh, thanks, thanks so much uh, for putting that together it's really cool once you've read the book to also hear the, the yeah. soundtrack to it um 
So I hate to keep going on about Ariadne, but I'll just say one thing because I was going to ask you why Naxos specifically in Greece, but then when I looked up Ariadne, uh, what this means in Greek mythology, it was the goddess of labyrinths and uh, uh, she is said to have been helping as some other figure of Theseus or something. And Theseus. then she was abandoned in the island of Naxos. Wow. <laughs> is what I read. You, you have done your research because <laughs> you're right. So Ariadne is a famous character in a Greek myth. And it's the story of, I won't tell the whole story, but uh, of the Minotaur and the labyrinth. And she's the one that saves the young hero Theseus. And they fall in love and they do travel back to the island of Naxos. So, uh, you know, the Greek islands are also one of my favorite places on earth. And Everybody goes to Santorini and Mykonos and, of course, Athens, but there's hundreds of islands. And Naxos is one that um, is a little bit off the beaten track, but it's, it's this beautiful, beautiful island. And yeah, the, the Greek myth of Ariadne um, takes place in Naxos. Well, so, very of course, nice. I, I, had to, I had to write about uh, Naxos. It was very clever. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> So I should have asked my colleague, Angie, who you met uh, briefly at the mm -hmm. beginning, who is Greek, which is her oh. favorite Greek island. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you so much, Glenn. It's been a pleasure uh, speaking to you. So now I'm just going to open it up to the audience in case uh, anyone listening in has a question. Please feel free to type it into the Q&A. Um, or the chat, and I will certainly uh, ask Glenn your questions. Um, and while we wait and see if anyone is um, courageous enough to put a question in there, I will ask Glenn, uh, what do you have in store as your next project? Um, I have some ideas. Um, it takes me a long time. Probably this is true for all writers, but it takes me a long time. I, I have some ideas. I need them to percolate a little bit. I, I attempt some writing that I know I'll probably throw out later, but as a way to get into the characters and, and get into the idea. So I'm sure it's many years off, but I have started on, on the next one. Uh, I'll, I'll give a little epilogue about our band is uh, during the pandemic, we were not allowed to play together. There was one, one Michael, uh, who's the chief songwriter, uh, him and I could get together. We thought, okay, you're in my bubble, so we could get together. And maybe a few months ago, we started to bring in the drummer. And it was just last night for the very first time in almost a year and a half that all five of us got together and, uh, and played together for, for the first time. And it was, it, it was amazing. It was just fantastic. Well, that must have been fun. Yeah, uh, it was so, really great. Glenn, are you saying that music will be central again in your next project? Music is central to my life, so I don't know how it will fit into the next one, um, but hopefully somehow. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not seeing any questions just yet. Um, let me think if I have anything else I wanted to ask you. The European uh, tour that the band goes on, is this, um, you know, is, did you get this idea from another band that did something similar in the 70s? Um, I think it's because it was more interesting for me, this was selfish, uh, <laughs> uh, to write about Europe. Uh, yes. I, I have this fascination of, of Europe, so any chance I can get to go over there or write about it, I, I, I love. I think it would just it was more interesting for me to write about a tour through Amsterdam and Paris and places like that than, no, no offense, but Billings, Montana, or <laughs> you know, some place in Wisconsin. I don't know. Um, and I guess it was this idea of the of the glamour of it, and 
And as I said, everything's seen through Levi's eyes. So Levi's never been anywhere. He's never been outside Calgary, for <laughs> God's sake. So to go to places like Paris, it was just wonder for him. And I, I wanted that sense in the book. Yes, I, I think you, you definitely uh, accomplished that. Uh, okay, so we do have something that just popped up in the chat. Okay. Uh, did it, whoops, I lost it. Did it happen often to merging bands that they had to pay studio fees? I think for every band that happened. So that was why the Rolling Stones built this uh, mobile recording studio so that they could, they could own it and use it whenever they wanted. Um, one of the big exceptions was the Beatles, who got free run of Abbey Road Studios. But I mean, they were the Beatles, so everybody knew they were going to make billions of dollars. Um, as far as I know, every single band had to play for that, pay for that studio time and a lot of other costs, renting of instruments, renting of this, that they had no idea that they were uh, on the hook for, for paying for that. Um, there's all kinds of crazy stories. Um, John Fogarty, it was the main singer songwriter for Creedence Clearwater Revival, huge band in the early seventies. Uh, he left that band uh, and he later got sued by the record company because his solo albums, he said, well, you sound too much like Creedence Clearwater Revival. And he said, I am Creedence Clearwater <laughs> Revival. That case, he was sued for $50 million. Uh, in the court case, he brought out his guitar and played for the judge. He played the old Creedence Clearwater songs and talked about where they had come from. He played his new songs and the judge just said, this is ridiculous, case dismissed. But he was literally sued for $50 million. That, that's a crazy story. Yeah. yeah. One story that comes to, my, to mind offhand uh, a while ago, but I feel as though I recall uh, Michael Jackson had the rights to certain Beatles songs yeah. and would not sell them back to uh, Paul McCartney, who wanted them back. Yeah, so I, I don't know the exact details, but at some point, uh, the Beatles publishing went up for sale. Paul McCartney tried to buy it for himself and Michael Jackson outbid him, which caused a big feud between them. Uh, the latest I heard about that is Paul McCartney finally did manage to buy the rights back for his own oh, songs. It's good. just, it's so crazy. <laughs> okay, that's good. I'm glad to hear that it was resolved yeah. because I thought it ended with Michael Jackson not letting him. Yeah. I see a hand up, so I'm going to try to allow the person to talk. Thank you, Danielle. It's hi, Carol. Carol. Hi, hi, Carol. Hi, hi. I'm really enjoying your, your uh, talk. There's so much that I didn't realize. What I want to know is now, a lot of the tunes we grew up with, well, I don't know how old you are, but I'm senior, that I know that the the uh, songwriters and the bands never got any, what's the word I want? Reimbursement. Like I know you want to see. Thank you. So, uh, who's getting the money when they are using these songs in the commercials? Uh, the publishing companies. So it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a complicated thing. So there there are record companies. There's publishing companies. Um, who own the rights to these songs. I should say that the, 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 the songwriters, they still do get a percentage, but they don't get all of it. Um, and it depends on the, the contract that you signed, which as we've been talking about in the early 70s is still, they got ripped off. For sure they got ripped off. Mm -hmm. um, even the Beatles got ripped off a little bit for, um, well, they're basically just naive is that, Brian Epstein was their manager. And at some point very early on, 1964 probably, uh, somebody wanted to buy the rights for their merchandising, which means t-shirts, uh, little dolls and all kinds of Beatles memorabilia. And Brian Epstein sold the rights, I believe for a thousand dollars, which is now worth hundreds of millions of dollars. 
they just didn't know. So mm. something else, Glenn, related to what Carol was asking is that I'm hearing songs now in commercials that I grew up with in mm -hmm. the early 80s. Now, mm -hmm. I feel as though um, the copyright has expired and this is why they're being used. Is that correct? I, I don't think I don't think the copyright expired. It it's depends. not something about like a 30 years and then it's kind of open where you could just use it. I don't I don't think so. I think, you know, it, copyright it copyright law keeps changing and yeah. I'm no expert in it, but I think it's something like 50 years after after the death of that person. Wow. So it depends. And there's certain entities like the Beatles, they did get smart later on. So their rights are all tied up. You're not going to really hear Beatles songs in commercials because it would cost millions and millions and millions of dollars. Uh, Led Zeppelin is the same. Um, the Disney Corporation is famous for that too. If you try to do some kind of imitation of Mickey Mouse, you're going to have Disney lawyers come at you. So it, de it depends on the corporation, depends on the contracts many different things. I, I know there's many stories. Well, political campaigns are interesting because I know Bruce Springsteen's songs were used, I think, by Trump. And he, Bruce Springsteen sued him, said, you, I don't care how much money you pay me, you have no right to use this. And I think he was successful, successful in court there. Mm -hmm. So I just want to mention something else you said that bands when they go on the road mm -hmm. that whatever money they make is their money because many times i said to myself they're so successful why are they killing themselves going on these road trips but now i understand yeah <laughs> that's that's where the real money goes into their pockets and, and nowhere else and we talked a little bit about in the book there's this a, a cash box i always talk about it and that's uh surly bob the manager he has this cash box uh, it, it was also based on Led Zeppelin that Led Zeppelin always asked after the concerts to be paid in cash because they didn't they didn't even trust anybody. So it all went into this cash box that had hundreds of thousands of dollars in it. And Surly Bob would never let this cash box out of his sight. And that's based on a true story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I look forward to reading your book. Oh, thank you. And maybe, the, and maybe you'll get movie rights, because I, I like the story of the uh, We Were Brothers. I forget what band that was. Do you know what I mean? It was Oh, just yeah, that's the band. Uh, Robbie Robert, Robertson. Yeah. Robbie Robertson, exactly. Yeah. Great. That's a documentary. Uh, something like When We Were Brothers. Yeah. I'm not yes, sure I've got it. the name so quite right. We yeah, 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 fantastic documentary. Uh, I'll tell you something, because you just brought up something, is that uh, this is my first published novel. I have some, you know, terrible pieces of writing in in my uh, in my desk that novels that will never see the <laughs> day. Uh, to move from writing nonfiction to a novel, I, I really wanted to make sure I got it right, and mm -hmm. so I I actually looked a lot at screenwriting. So mm -hmm. there's some very good book for the writers out there. There's some very good books on screenwriting that are not formulaic, but they they really uh, tell you how to structure a story, the best way to tell a story. So that really helped in the writing of this. It, um, I, I, would, I would love to sell the screen rights to this. And I think if it ever did get made into a movie, it would be fairly easy to change it into a script because it, it was basically written with that in mind. Well, we wish you definitely all the best and uh, that would be great because the last couple of authors that we did have on, um, Cynthia Depri Sweeney, her book, The Nest, not her most recent, but a very mm. popular book is being turned into an AMC uh, series. And uh, Marissa Stapley, her book, Lucky, is going to also be turned into a television series by the person who did Lost. Wow. Uh, so, so maybe uh, everyone who comes here who has a cinematic sort of a story uh, has that possibility. <laughs> that would be great. So we're maybe hoping that luck that's will the case. rub off. 
So thank you so much. Thank you, Carol, for your excellent questions. And thank you, Glenn, uh, for a wonderful uh, afternoon chat. Thank you. It was fun. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.